chapter number 14 Re reactivity series in reactivity series we're going to talk about different metals and how one metal is more reactive than other and if one is more reactive or if one is less reactive how they are going to interact with one another not just that we're going to put all the metals in one series and we're going to compare them all in a single go we call that reactivity series let's start with the very basics we are familiar with displacement reactions and we are familiar that different metals and non-metals go with displacement reactions. If not, let's discuss a displacement reaction with the example of metal oxides, which is given over here. Now, you can simply take a tripod stand, you can put up a wire gauze, you can put up a ceramic paper, you can heat it from the bottom, and you can use a, a couple of things. One of them is me tell you it's a black powder and the other one is magnesium the formula of which is actually that's just element so if we're going to write it as mg and it's actually a little bit gray in color though it has a silvery appearance but gray is good enough to explain it now as soon as you're going to mix them and heat them a little bit you're going to have this kind of splash and they're going to react with one another now, you would see that it would turn into some white ash. <clears throat> and actually, what happens is that magnesium reacts with copper to oxide, and it then forms magnesium oxide and leaves copper out. Now, we have this kind of splash because the reaction is very vigorous, and the displacement, and by, by displacement, I mean uh, I mean, copper has a compound with oxygen, as you can see over here. So magnesium is going to make a compound with oxygen as the product, and it would push copper out of its place. We call it displacement. Displacement is when some more reactive metal or non-metal takes the place of the less reactive one in a compound or a salt solution. So copper was present in the form of compound, magnesium was present in its elemental form, and magnesium took place of copper to form the compound itself. Why? Because magnesium is more reactive and is able to displace copper. Let's go through the very basic of observations, some safety instructions, and let's discuss the entire reactivity series as a whole. Okay? So first of all, safety. For a safety note, this demonstration definitely requires goggle or a face shield or both are better, together with safety screens in a very well ventilated room. The bench should be protected by a large sheet of cardboard. The people should be at the back of the room. One gram of mixture is strongly heated in a metal ground bottle cap before retiring to the back of the room to await a violent reaction. Nothing happens after a minute or so. Turn off the gas, do not touch the mixture, but leave it to cool and dispose it off in water. So actually this kind of reaction is very vigorous. So we only go with teacher's demonstration would not allow the students to perform it on their own. Plus, as you can see, they are going for a lot of safety measurements. For example, goggles, face shields, a ventilated room, safety screens, a large sheet of cardboard to keep everyone safe. So these kind of reactions can be very violent, vigorous, or we can even use the word explosive. These adjectives can explain these reactions better and make sure you use the same adjectives for the same purpose. Magnesium powder and copper two oxide are mixed together, heated strongly. This is the reaction I just told you on the top by writing it myself. This is a displacement reaction. Uh, what I explained earlier is similar to what's written over here and less reactive metal, copper has been displaced by the more reactive magnesium. Now, any metal higher in the reactivity series can easily displace the one lower from a compound or from its salt solution. If you heat copper with magnesium oxide, nothing would happen. Why? Because copper is less reactive than magnesium and copper is not able, capable of displacing magnesium. So what is the result of all of this? The result is this series. Now, let me explain on the top of the list, this series has to be memorized by the student in order, which means you cannot switch the places of any of the metals or non-metals out of the series. So for an easy memorization, let me give you a few tips. 
Starting with this, you would see that most of these elements are metals. But let me tell you, there is one that is written in brackets. This one is a non-metal. And there is another one written in brackets. This one again is a non-metal. Right? So these two are non-metals, the rest are all metals. This divides the entire series into three parts. The first part, then there is a non-metal. The second part, then there is again a non-metal. And then there is a third part. I tend to tell my students that the part on the top are the most reactive metals. These metals are most reactive. I'm using the name because they will tend to go with vigorous, fast, sometimes explosive, sometimes boilet reactions. These are moderately reactive. They are present in the center of both non-metals. So writing the phrase moderately reactive explains them very well. And the ones at the bottom can then be least reactive. This kind of bifurcation would make it easier for you to memorize them separately. So you can memorize them copper, silver, and gold as least reactive. Just zinc and carbon are moderately reactive. And then there is a long list on top, potassium, sodium, lithium, calcium, magnesium, and aluminum for more reactive metals. Sometimes when the students try to memorize it, we also give them this kind of hint. For example, this one is K, this one is Na, this one is Li, this one is Ca, Mg, Al, then C, Zn, Fe. These are the symbols that are present in the periodic table. And it might make it easier for you, rather than remembering the names, you can simply memorize the symbols. Students come up with funny ways to memorize this. For example, I've seen students uh, who uh, give uh, make a long word out of this all. For example, Kanali, Kamag, Alsi, Zanfi, Huku, <laughs> Haku. So they have uh, funny ways to memorize this. So whether you memorize it phonetically like I just did, or you memorize the whole names in order, or you memorize it by bifurcating into three parts, it's entirely up to you. But what you're supposed to do is that you're supposed to memorize it and memorize it in order. Don't forget the reactivity is maximum at the top. And as you go down, the reactivity decreases so that it's least at the bottom. Get the point? Yes. Okay. The principle for displacement reaction is pretty simple. For displacement reactions, anything that is present above in the table is capable of displacing anything below it. But no metal or non-metal is capable of displacing anything above it. Let's practice. Would you think calcium would be able to displace copper? You can simply answer me in yes or no. Would calcium be able to displace copper? Yes. And why do you think so? Because calcium is more reactive. Right. Calcium is present at the top of the list as compared to copper, which is present beneath it on the list, which means calcium is more reactive and copper is less reactive. So this displacement is possible. How about iron displacing aluminum? Is that possible? No. Good, good. So answering these simple questions, give me the idea that you get a hang of it, right? Yes. Let's move on. Okay. <clears throat> so these reactions involve metals and metal oxides. We also call them competition reaction. Apart from displacement reactions, we can call them competition reactions. It's very simple. But the competition is in between the reactivity and most of the time the most reactive one wins than the less reactive one. <clears throat> now, um, the reaction between magnesium and zinc oxide. 
Magnesium can also react with zinc oxide. It produces zinc metal for us. Take a look. This reaction is possible because magnesium is more reactive than zinc oxide, zinc. In the reactivity series, hence it displaces zinc, forms magnesium oxide, and puts zinc out of the reaction as a, an elemental form. Take a look. In this case, you are reacting all solid powders with one another. The reaction between carbon and copper oxide, a mixture of carbon and copper oxide is heated inside of this tube. The mixture glows red because of the heat given out of this uh, carbon. And the pink brown copper is left in the tube as a white gas, a slightly white gas carbon dioxide leaves the system. Carbon is above copper in the reactivity series, so this displacement is possible. Now, a question may arise that what if you had to go with this kind of reaction in exams? Sorry. What if this kind of reaction is given in exams? How are you supposed to answer it? Your answer should be very simple. No reaction. You're not supposed to write the products as there aren't any. Okay? So for any reaction in which the element is uh, less reactive and the compounds, metal or non-metal, is more reactive, there would be no reaction. The simple element has to be more reactive than the metal or the non-metal present in the compound. For example, in this case, carbon is more reactive than copper, so hence it displaces. Copper is present as a part of the compound, carbon is present in its pure elemental form. The reaction is possible. However, the vice versa or the opposite is not possible. Remember, for any kind of reactions like these, always wear eye protection, the tube will get very hot, so uh, remain so for some time. So take good care of yourself and always be careful performing these kind of experiments in lab. Now, you might be uh, thinking about why have we put a couple of non-metals in entire reactivity series of metals? Your question might be about hydrogen or carbon. Let me explain. Hydrogen is included in reactivity series because it's important in extracting several metals, including iron itself, from metal oxides. If the metal is less reactive than carbon, which means it's below in the reactivity series, then heating with carbon can be a very cheap way of removing oxygen from the oxide to leave the metal, as you have seen in the previous example. Copper isn't in fact extracted like this. This reaction is simply a lab illustration and carbon is above copper in the reactivity series. That's why this reaction was possible. What we are trying to make as a point over here is that any metal within its oxide as the major ore in the Earth's crust can easily be extracted by using carbon if it's present in this reactivity series below carbon. By that we mean zinc, iron, copper, silver, gold. But don't, we don't do it most of the time with all of the metals, but uh, of course, we can show it as a lab illustration as was just explained on the second page. Now, many metals are found as metal oxides in nature. If they are found as other compounds, these can often be converted into metal oxides before the metal is extracted out of it using carbon. That's why carbon is a part of the series. Why is hydrogen a part of the series? I think we have already explained that in the electrolysis portion in which hydrogen ions uh, actually show a separate behavior going towards the cathode. Although hydrogen is a non-metal and most of the time cathode uh, were, was depositing metals in that chapter, but hydrogen was the only non-metal that was getting deposited on cathode, not exactly deposited, bubbled out of it, but the point still being hydrogen being a non-metal and going to the cathode. That's why carbon and hydrogen are considered important enough to be a part of reactivity series that only consists metals. Make sense? Yes. Good. Let's talk about oxygen transfer. Not just oxygen transfer, we are going to talk about oxidation and reduction reactions. Are you familiar with these reactions already? Sir? Are you familiar with oxidation and reduction reactions previously? Yes. Because we, yes. we have discussed them a few times. 
So I think you would understand easily when I say oxidation is gain of, uh, was loss of electron, but in case of oxygen transfer, it's gain of oxygen. Reduction is loss of oxygen. So I think this reaction pretty easily tells us that we don't need to calculate the electrons. Instead, we can take it in the form of oxygen transfer. Magnesium gained oxygen, so oxidation reaction. Copper lost oxygen, so reduction reaction. As both oxidation and reduction reactions are occurring simultaneously, we call it a redox reaction. If this one is a redox reaction, one of them can be a reducing agent and one of them can be an oxidizing agent. If you remember, I taught you that oxidation reaction gives us the reducing agent. So magnesium in this case is the reducing agent. And reduction reaction gives us the oxidizing agent, which means copper oxide in this case is the oxidizing agent. Get the point? Yes. Good, good. If you get the point, why don't you solve a small example for me? Okay. Let's take an example. As I've already solved this kind of example, how about this one? Now, can you tell me which one is gaining oxygen in this reaction? Is it carbon or is it copper oxide? The one gaining oxygen. The copper? Carbon, very good. So carbon gains oxygen and forms carbon dioxide. It's pretty easy. Carbon was alone. Now carbon is written with a couple of oxygen atoms. Which one's losing oxygen? Of course, that's going to be copper oxide because copper was previously coupled with oxygen, but now copper is alone on the right-hand side of the equation. Remember, as we said earlier, the one that gains oxygen is going with an oxidation reaction and the one that is losing oxygen is going with a reduction reaction, which means that this one is going to be what kind of agent? An oxidation reaction? What kind of agent is the carbon? That's the opposite name. I just hinted about it. So this one is going to be reducing agent, right? So your voice is lagging. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the one going with the oxidation reaction is supposed to be the reducing agent. So this one is the reducing agent. And the one going with the reduction reaction is supposed to be the oxidizing agent. So copper oxide in this case is oxidizing agent. This one is then the oxidizing agent. Easy enough? Yes. Good, good. So I think with these oxide kind of reactions, you can always come up with the names of oxidizing or reducing agent. Shall we practice one more? Yes. Okay, why don't I move to the equation on the top, magnesium and copper oxide. Which among, among these is the oxidizing agent and which one is the reducing agent? As there are two species, this one and this one, one of them is an oxidizing agent, one of them is a reducing agent. Which one's which? The magnesium. And what's magnesium? Oxidizing. Again. A reduction. Magnesium reducing agent. Very good. Magnesium is going to be the reducing agent. Why is it reducing agent? Because it's getting oxidized itself. It's gaining oxygen. Reducing agent gains oxygen. All right, let's do it like this. And oxidizing agent loses oxygen. Oh, sir, I can't hear you. Sorry, I didn't get that. 
get the point all right if you're clear we can move forward right uh, sir can i rejoin because your voice keeps lagging yeah sure sure that's fine go ahead so in this specific reaction magnesium is the re reducing agent because of gaining oxygen and copper oxide is the oxidizing agent because it's losing oxygen let's clear it up move forward so the same thing is mentioned over here let's talk about electron transfer in case of electron transfer if you notice closely you would come to know that the one that is losing electrons is going with oxidation of course that we have previously discussed like magnesium and the copper oxide is actually in this case copper is gaining electrons magnesium can be converted into magnesium oxide only if magnesium is capable of losing electrons like this then actually oxygen is already present in the oxide form that's why cuo is actually made up of cu2o plus o negative 2 magnesium ion reacts with o negative 2 and gives us mgo however this one which is left over reacts with this one which is also left and is converted into copper hence we have these two products given over here all right so this is what actually happens magnesium is losing electrons copper is gaining those electrons so magnesium is going with oxidation and copper oxide is going with reduction reactions this is as per electron transfer and the same thing is somewhat explained over here. So you are supposed to get these numbers of oxidation states on top of them. So it's easy for you to solve which one is going into which state. So copper is plus two, oxygen is negative two, magnesium is plus two, or oxygen is negative two. Make sense? Yes. All right. Then in this kind of equation, if magnesium is going from this state, which is zero to plus two, magnesium is actually losing electrons. And copper is going from plus two to zero, so copper is gaining electrons. It's the same thing which I wrote over here. Magnesium goes from zero to plus two, and copper goes from plus two to zero. Right? Same thing is mentioned over here and here. So these are the basic understandings. Don't worry, I'm going to give you a couple of very important tips. The oxide ion does not change. It only ends up with a different partner. So it's totally unchanged itself. What happens in the reactions is when magnesium atoms are turning into magnesium ions by losing two electrons and copper ions are gaining those two electrons to form copper atoms. This is a redox reaction. Oxidation occurs with the loss of magnesium, electrons for magnesium and reduction occurs from the gain of electrons to copper ions. So oxidation, loss of electron, reduction, gain of electron, oil rig can be a mnemonic to easily remember it. All right. But apart from all that, a little tip for exams. Okay. More reactive metal becomes a better reducing agent. So if you see a reaction like this, 
you need to quickly check out which one is more reactive and which one's less. As we already know that this one's more reactive and this one's less reactive. So this one is going to be the reducing agent. All right. And of course, if this one is going to be the reducing agent, this one is going to be the oxidizing agent. That's another way to solve it. And that's the way which always gets you marks because it's a correct way to solve it. Get the point? Yes. Okay, let me explain, explain the science behind it. The more reactive metal is a better reducing agent because it is easier for it to lose electrons. Losing electrons, as explained over here, is oxidation. So something that is easily oxidized is a better reducing agent. And something that it's oxidized with a difficulty actually, on the other hand in comparison becomes a, an oxidizing agent. So this one is a reducing and this one is an oxidizing agent. Make sense? Yes. Good, good. So let me tell you, it's almost the same thing in oxygen transfer. This one is more reactive, this one is less reactive. So this one is going to be a better reducing agent. This one is going to be uh, an oxidizing agent in comparison when they are reacting with one another. And the same thing is mentioned over here. So anything, and let me take you a couple of pages back, anything which is present on the top of this reactivity series would be a better reducing agent if compared with anything at the bottom. So if we are comparing uh, magnesium and aluminum with one another, magnesium is going to be the reducing agent and aluminum's compound is going to become the oxidizing agent. In the similar way, if we are comparing zinc with iron, zinc is supposed to become a better reducing agent and iron is supposed to become the oxidizing agent in its salt or compound form. Why? Because zinc is on top, iron is at bottom, or magnesium is on top, aluminum is at bottom. So the reactivity series is going to help you decide every time in a redox reaction whether which one's oxidizing or which one's reducing agent. Clear enough? Yes. Good. Good. That's clear. Let's back, get back to our original page. So let's discuss a few displacement reaction involving solutions of salt. The reaction between zinc and copper two sulfate solution. Now this is a pretty interesting reaction as this is a colorful reaction to be done in the lab. And this is commonly done by students with their own hands. This is not a demonstration reaction. Students can easily perform it. So what we are gonna do is that we're going to take solid zinc and we're going to react it with an aqueous solution of copper two sulfate. Copper two sulfate has a very good blue color. Now, as soon as it starts reacting with zinc, the color of the solution fades as zinc sulfate is actually colorless. But at the same time, we can soon see some pink brown copper settling at the bottom. So actually this is a very colorful reaction. Let me clarify the colors again. This is a gray metal. This is a blue solution. This one, however, is a colorless solution. And this one is pink brown. And remember, as it's a solid, it's supposed to settle down at the bottom. So zinc and copper are the metals consisting simply of atoms. But copper two sulfate and zinc sulfate are metal compounds and so are ionic. So this equation is written in ions. We separated the copper sulfate, this copper sulfate into two parts, copper ions and sulfate ions. We also separated the ionic compound into two parts, zinc ions 
and sulfate ions. Now these are same on both ends. So we are supposed to cut them out and we call them spectator ions as we did in previous chapters. So we're calling them spectator ions, remove those ions and you'll get your ionic equation. Writing ionic equations is a pretty important task as per past papers. So you should be able to write any ionic equations and we have practiced it already too. Am I right? Yes. Good, good. So when we looked at the reaction between magnesium and copper oxide above, we also wrote ions in the equation, but we did not separate them completely because the ions are in a solid. We can only separate everything like this when things are in solution. Why? Because in a solution, the ions are free to move around separately, but in a solid, they're not able to do so. That's why we write it like these only in the case of solution reactions. You won't be able to cancel out this or remove the spectator ions and write an ionic equation for a solid system. This can only be done for solutions. I hope you understand the explanation, do you? Yes. Okay, let me tell you this is also a redox reaction. So it is pretty easy for you to look at this equation and tell that which one's oxidizing and which one's reducing. There is solid zinc, there are copper ions, which are producing zinc ions and cause solid copper. So among these reactants, can you tell me which one is the oxidizing and which one is the reducing agent? Remember, you can easily take help from the reactivity series. Copper is oxidizing. Very good. Copper ions are oxidizing agent and zinc being more reactive is the reducing agent. So I hope you understand why they have written this one as oxidation. Why? Because this is a reducing agent and this one as reduction. Why? Because this is an oxidizing agent. Well done. Let's go with the key point at the bottom of this page. Which copper do you uh, to salt you started with would not matter. As long as it was soluble in water, copper to chloride, copper to nitrate would react in the exactly same way with zinc. Why? Because chloride ions and nitrate ions would again be spectator ions and will not be participating in the reaction whatsoever. Hence, whenever we write the ion equation, it's to remove the spectator ions. We don't care if it's sulfate or it's chloride or it's nitrate. If it's getting dissolved, if it's making a solution, the reaction would always go in the same way as explained. So, moving on. The zinc atoms are oxidized to zinc ions. Why? Because they lose electrons. The copper ions gain electron and reduce to copper atoms. We can split these ion equations into two parts, the oxidation ones separately and the reduction ones separately, as I did earlier for you too. These are known as ionic half equations. This is the oxidation half equation. This is the reduction half equation, which means the examiner may ask you for a chemical equation. He may ask you for a word equation. Now I'm elaborating all different kinds of equations he may ask you for. He may ask you for an ionic equation or oxidation half equation or reduction half equation. So keep your options open as there are many kinds of equations. He may ask you to write any specific type and go with the type. The chemical equations write everything in a balanced form. The word equation only uses words. You, we do not need to balance it. So we only use names. Ion equations are written when you cut out or cancel out the spectator ions. Oxidation half equation only caters the oxidation part of the reaction, while reduction half equation only caters the reduction part of the reaction, right? Oxidation always tells us the loss of electrons being 
electrons being written on the right hand side of course with a plus sign and reduction reactions always tell us about gain of electrons electrons are always written as a part of reactants of course with a plus sign being added to the stuff hence reduction which perfectly makes sense does it yes good so be ready for any kind of equation and write in the similar way be vigilant when reading the question and try answering the examiner with the type he wants as there are many types you so you should be able to go with any type he asks for now <coughs> oxidizing and reducing agent in terms of electrons oxidizing agent is something that oxidizes something else by taking electrons away from it so actually oxidizing agent accept electrons so this one is pretty easy to understand <clears throat> so i'm going to sum it up in both ways oxidizing agent is actually losing oxygen and gaining electrons that's about it reducing agent would be exact opposite they would gain oxygen but they would lose electrons and the same thing is written over here in terms of electron transfer i'm just summing it up because as we have studied uh, oxygen transfer already so now if we are studying electron transfer defining oxidizing agent on both ways it should be easy and simple so should be the reducing agent so if oxidizing agent is losing oxygen and gaining electrons the reducing agent would definitely gain oxygen but lose electrons take a look over here in these reactions you can see that it's uh, zinc is losing electrons and zinc is going to be a reducing agent and copper ions are gaining electrons so copper ions are oxidizing agent i'm not asking you this question because you have already correctly answered the question now you have two definitions of oxidation and it's reverse in case of reduction which one should you should you use use whichever one is simpler in the case you are asked about both definitions are true don't worry too much about this at the moment with a little experience you'll find it is obvious which one you need to use in which case for example this case you can only use electron transfer definition why because in the entire reaction there is nothing mentioned of oxygen so you can't use this definition over here you have to use this definition over here make sense yes good so with a little experience you would get to know which equation can be used where now the reaction between copper and silver nitrate solution this reaction can be easily performed silver is below copper in the reactivity series which makes silver less reactive than copper a coil of copper wire in a silver nitrate solution will produce metallic silver and this figure tells you how metallic silver is getting formed around the wire coil wire quickly the mixture is actually producing a gray fur and delicate crystals of silver notice the solution is becoming blue because copper nitrate is blue so let me explain this is actually a pink brown solid this one is pink brown this one's a colorless liquid but after a while it is converting into a blue solution because of copper nitrate ions and this one is actually a gray metal so you would see a gray metal over here and a blue solution over here so this is the ionic equation nitrate ions would be spectator ions and we are going to this Uh, exclude them from the ionic equation this is another redox reaction copper is losing electrons while silver is gaining those so we say copper it is the reducing agent and silver ions are the oxidizing agents make sense are we clear
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, but not properly. All right, I had a minor issue, but I think you would be able to hear me now properly. Can you now? Yes. All right. So I was saying, and I was talking about copper being the reducing agent and silver ions being the oxidizing agent. So I think this makes sense, does it? Yes. Good. Moving forward. The ionic half equations for copper ions and silver ions are also written. Take a look, this equation might need a little balancing as copper ions are losing two electrons and silver can only gain one. So we need to balance it with producing, writing a two over here, here and here, just like over here and over here. So sometimes you might need to add another two to the equation in order to balance the whole set of electrons from here and here. So writing the simple half, reduction half equation, even if you don't write those twos in this equation, that's fine. But when you're writing the ionic equation, you would definitely need to balance both sides. All right? Okay. Okay. So reaction of metals with water. Let's go with a general summary. Metals above in the reactivity series can easily react with water. Specifically, the ones that are on the top can react with cold water and they would produce metal hydroxide plus hydrogen, such as sodium when reacting with water in its liquid form, by that we mean cold water, can produce sodium hydroxide and can produce hydrogen. The equation can be balanced like this, right? This is for cold water. However, there are some metals which are then less reactive as you go down in the series and the reactions become less and less vigorous. In that case, water does not react as water, instead it reacts in the form of steam. But the products are a little different. In this time, you are not going to form a hydroxide. Instead, you're going to form an oxide. For example, this one. Can you notice the differences? I mean, with cold water, it's hydroxide, and with steam, it's oxide. Notice the difference? So as we go down the reactivity series, the reaction I totally forgot to record. Well, we have last portion, just simply let's cover it up. Rusting of iron. Iron rusts in the presence of oxygen and water. Rusting occurs with iron in most common alloy of iron mild steel. This is the formula for rust. You would notice something in the formula that along with iron, we have oxygen and we have water. That's why the statement has been given. Rust occurs in the presence of oxygen and water because both are added to this formula. X is a variable number. So if you take a look at this formula, number of water molecules is going to be vary. Is going to vary. And this actually varies from place to place, area to area on the planet. The hydrated iron three oxide is a part of it, however. Rusting can be described as a redox reaction. Iron is oxidized which means iron loses electrons. So metals corrode, but it is the only corrosion of 
iron that is referred as rusting Forming rust from iron is a surprisingly complicated process. The iron loses electrons to form iron two ions, which are further oxidized by the air into iron three ions. The reactions involve the water produce, which produce the actual rust. Rusting actually makes us lose the metal. It eats the metal up. Rusting is a bad thing as metal is no more capable of showing its properties like its shine, malleability, ductility, strength, all of those properties. So we try to prevent rusting as much as we can. We can prevent rusting by different methods. The first one is using barriers. Now, in order to keep water and oxygen away from iron, we can actually cause a barrier. We can put up a barrier by painting it. Paint is like an insulation. It does not allow water or oxygen to pass. We can coat it in oil or grease, which also acts like a barrier, or we may cover it in plastic. Coating iron with the metal below for example, coating steam with tins or for tin cans is also a barrier method. Barrier methods are usually quite cheap ways of preventing rusting. The problem with barrier method is that once the coating is broken, the iron underneath is exposed to oxygen and water and will start rusting. For example, let's say you have a piece of iron and you paint it red on the outer end. And this red paint is then going to act as a barrier. But once this barrier breaks, the iron would then be exposed to oxygen and water in the atmosphere. And there you go, the rusting would start again. So the barrier method has to be repeated after regular intervals. That's why sometimes we keep repainting the structures again and again. We repaint them after every year, or we repaint them twice a year. We may repaint them after a couple of years. We keep repainting them. We keep reapplying the barriers, whether that's plastic, whether that's paint, whether that's a coat of oil or a coat of grease, or that's a coat of a thin, slight coat of another metal on top of the current metal surface, uh, it can be any kind of barrier and those barriers would be done over and over again, repainted, redone in order to keep up the barrier and in order to prevent rusting for a longer duration of time, such as decades. There is another way. We call that galvanizing. Now, wherever the word galvanized is used, Remember, it has something to do with zinc. In this case, iron is coated with a layer of zinc. Now, the good part about zinc is that zinc is more reactive than iron. Why? Because zinc is present on top and iron is present at the bottom in comparison to one another. So as long as the zinc layer is unscratched, it serves as a barrier to air and water. However, the iron still doesn't rust when some of the zinc on the surface has been scratched away. Why? Zinc tends to rust and lose electrons instead of iron in preference to iron. Why? Because zinc is more reactive. So even if the surface is slightly scratched away, zinc will not let the iron rust until it has rusted completely. So zinc corrodes instead of iron. Remember, the rusting word is only used for iron and for any other metal on the planet, we're going to use the word corrode. Galvanized iron does not rust even in, with an instant contact with air or water.
good. So during the process, when zinc is still trashed away, zinc loses electrons and tries to get oxidized in preference to iron. These electrons flow to iron. The iron atom, which already has lost electrons, would immediately regain the electrons. So the iron cannot form ions, it can't rust. So this method, which is a little more expensive than the perio techniques, is costs us a little much, but, but at the end, we are safe from rusting for a longer duration of time. Make sense? Yes. Good. Moving on to the last part, preventing rusting by using sacrificial protection. As the word suggests, we are going to sacrifice a more reactive metal and we are going to save a less reactive or protect a less reactive one. In this case, zinc, magnesium or aluminum blocks are attached to metal hulls or kneels, keels of the ship in order to prevent the iron and steel from rusting. For this to work, you have to use a metal that is more reactive than iron. Hence the examples of zinc or of magnesium or of aluminum. They're all more reactive than iron. They corrode instead of iron rusting. We are call them, we can call them sacrificial anodes. These sacrificial anodes have to be replaced rationally when the more reactive metal has completely been oxidized. This type of protection is used in large structures where it would be very difficult to use a barrier method effectively. Galvanizing is a combination of barrier method and sacrificial protection both. Underground pipelines are also protected using sacrificial nodes. In this case, lumps of magnesium are attached at intervals along the pipe. The very reactive magnesium corrodes in preference to the iron and actually provides electrons to iron ions so that they can stop the ionization of iron and they do not let iron rust. Make sense? Yes. 